right, I want to welcome everyone tonight to Delaware Christian Fellowship, and it seems like it's been a long time since we were able to have a uh, service here and to have our teaching. I think it's been about four weeks, but uh, it's great to have you with us tonight, and uh, just want to bring to a conclusion over the next couple of weeks this long series that we have done entitled Basic Bible Fundamentals, and we have looked at uh, to a greater or lesser degree, the basic fundamentals of the historic Christian faith from a full gospel type perspective. And uh, the final chapter in this series is entitled The Judgment. And I want to talk this week about the judgment of the righteous, although we will talk about judgment in general. And then next week, I want to finish this entire series with a session entitled The Judgment of the unrighteous. Okay, so uh, you won't want to miss that. So it's uh, a a very powerful teaching indeed. So um, after this series is completed, it is my intention, Lord willing, of course, that we would go into uh, another series. I don't know how long it would last based upon a book I wrote in 2012 uh, called Televangelicalism. And what that book is about is uh, traces the history of evangelism and how people came to the Lord uh, from the book of Acts all the way up to modern times. And the subtitle of that book is How We Lost the Gospel and How to Get It Back. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. And that'll sort of coincide with the uh, documentary series that I've been working on for a number of years and I hope to complete over the next several months as well. So. That's just a, a little bit of information over what I hope to have happening over the next few weeks. But let's go ahead and get started tonight uh, on our topic. All right. So uh, our subject, of course, again, is the judgment and the judgment of the righteous. Okay. So. Amen. There will be a judgment of the just and the unjust or the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what the scripture clearly teaches. And we're just going to uh, look at that over the next few weeks. Now, I have a golden text for this uh, session tonight, and it's taken from John chapter 5, verse 21 through 29. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he who does not, he does not rather come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That, of course, is Jesus. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. You will know that is a messianic term uh, that deals with Jesus' humanity, the fact that Uh, He was tested in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So he's the perfect person to be uh, the judge. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out, and those those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, or as it says in the King James, the resurrection of damnation. So here we basically have it. We have the two different categories of people and judgment as it's going to play out. Jesus, of course, and God the Father are going to judge. Uh, the Father has committed judgment to the Son, and why not? He is the, Again, he's the perfect person for the job. He has walked in human flesh. He was tested in all points like as we yet without sin. So he understands the feeling of our infirmity. And uh, he is the perfect person for that job. Amen. Now, I just want to say a few things about uh, judgment and the topic of judgment as we're getting started. And this is something that I came to the conclusion 
uh, many years ago. I'm talking probably 25, 30 years ago when I first turned my life over to Christ, when I was born again, when I received the Holy Spirit, began reading the Bible, uh, I came to the conclusion that the Bible has a lot to say about judgment, and not just judgment in the sense of just a specific event, but all of the criteria that go into the judgment. Um, if you were to go through your Bible with a highlighter and just highlight every verse, especially in the New Testament, that relates to judgment and has some kind of connection with the judgment, you would find that your Bible would be literally just, just page after page uh, you would find that deals with this subject. And I made this statement here that I want to uh, just, just give you tonight. If preachers and teachers would do the analysis, okay, and then emphasize judgment at the same level statistically that we find in the New Testament, they would all be labeled as hellfire and brimstone type preachers and teachers. Um, you would be shocked at how much the Bible talks about the topic of judgment and how uh, and, and about things that are going to happen at the end times and how our works are related to that and how people, and we'll talk about this in this lesson tonight, but they've done things and because they've done them a certain way, they've already received their reward. Okay, so they don't have a reward coming in heaven. So this is all throughout the New Testament. And um, I, I just want to say that again, they would be like, we'd all be labeled hellfire and brimstone preachers. If we just did the analysis and we emphasize judgment the same way it's found statistically in the New Testament, uh, we'd be considered hellfire and brimstone preachers. Objective of this uh, session, these next two sessions, I should say, and here's what it is. It's not to give you a definitive uh, understanding of judgment. It would take months and months uh, to do that, okay? So I just want to touch upon the topic. But again, here's the objective, and that is to encourage, or I could say to beg every human being on earth, okay, to make a study of the judgments in the Bible. Don't take your favorite pastor's word for it, and God bless the pastors, God bless the teachers, but don't take their word for it because it's the most important topic that you can possibly study. It's not mathematics, it's not your job, it's not going to be something that's related to this present world. The most important subject you can possibly study is how to be right with God and ultimately the criteria in the situation that's going to ultimately come to pass where we all, as human beings, are going to stand before God as individuals to give an account of our life. This is something that we all need to be familiar with and as familiar as possible so that this issue could be before our eyes and we could recognize it. Not so that we could live in fear and not so that we could be paralyzed with the thought that, oh, I'm going to stand before God, but that we're always conscious of the fact that our words, that our actions, our works are ultimately going to be uh, judged by God. Understand that we're all going to answer to God for how we have lived. I remember it's been about 20 years ago now that I was teaching an adult Sunday school class, and I was talking about how the scriptures, just reading the passage of scripture, that by your word you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned, and every idle word that a man shall speak or woman, they will give an account in the day of judgment. And someone raised their hand in the class and they said, well, does that mean every word that's not forgiven or every word that's under the blood? And I remember being struck in that moment, almost like a gotcha question, if you know what those are. And I know it wasn't intended to be that, but what it ended up being was a question that has been on my mind ever since. Not, of course, on a regular basis, but it comes to my mind from time to time. And I've concluded that there are people who think that somehow they're just going to pray the blood of Jesus Christ over their whole life and just say, Lord, just can forgive me for all of it. And somehow that's just going to give them a free pass in the judgment. And I'm not saying that our sins aren't forgiven, because they are. They're cast as far as the east is from the west, and 
God sins and rem that God said it's our sins and iniquities, he would remember no more. And that is remember him against us. But there is still a sense in which we have got to give an account of our life. I've got to give an account for all the teachings that I've done. I've got to give an account for all the preaching I've done, for the way I've raised my family. And I can't just in a blatant sense, oh God, forgive me of it all and just forget it. Because there's still a sense in which we're all going to be accountable to God. It doesn't mean you're going to hell for something or anything, but we are accountable in some kind of way. And uh, the Bible is very clear on that. And it's not uh, as simple as just saying, well, I ticked the little box and I asked God to forgive me, so therefore I don't have anything to answer for. No, we do still have to give an account to God. And uh, it's important that we understand that. Jesus said in Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, and I am bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. You see that? To repay each person for what they have done. That's what Jesus is coming to do. Revelation 20, verses 12 to 13, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were raised and judged, rather, out of the things that were written in the books, according to their works. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, listen to this, which were written in the books. So there are things that we are doing. There are things that uh, we are saying. There are attitudes that we have that are being written down. They are being documented, okay? And there is going to be a judgment at some point. This, of course, is the great white throne judgment, which we, of course, believe is the judgment of the unrighteous. But nevertheless, there is a record. Some believe there's a recording angel that is recording all these things, but God has a perfect record of all of these things. But everyone is going to be judged out of the things that are written in the books according to to their works. So that's something to keep in mind. False assurance, okay? False assurances. Matthew 7, 22 to 23. Many will say to me in that day, what day? On judgment day. Lord, Lord. Now when you see words doubled up, they're done for emphasis. This person is proclaiming the Lord to be the ultimate Lord. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that practice lawlessness, or that work iniquity. The King James has it. So what is this saying? There are people that believe that simply because God's using them in ministry, that that's a free pass. That that means, oh, I'm good luck with God. I'm just like that with God. But uh, clearly there are going to be people, many, not some, in that day, who believe that because they operate in what we call the prophetic, okay, that they, um, that they are right with God, and they're going to make it. They're going to be shocked when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. And I believe the tenses in the Greek are, at no time did I ever know you. You that work iniquity. Now, what does that mean? Well, you boil the commandments all down. The Jews had them codified to 613, 365 don'ts, 248 do's. Then we had the Ten Commandments. And if you believe it, the seven Noahide laws before that. But here's the thing. It all boils down to two things. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, to treat your neighbor in the way that you would be, want to be treated if you were them. And see, that's how the, the, the law and the prophets are all boiled down, okay? And that's what happens. When a person is working iniquity, it means they're not loving their neighbor as their self. They're not treating their neighbor the way that they would want to be treated if they were them. And there's a lot that we could say along that line because the Bible bears this out all through the New Testament. But Jesus said there will be people that believe based upon their operation in the supernatural that they're good with God and they're going to be very surprised to find out that he was judging them based upon their behavior and how they treated others. Okay, The damnable sin of non-response to the gospel. Even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Woe unto you, Chosarin, woe unto you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty deeds had been done in, 
in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they would have a uh, great long, long ago repented in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, C Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, you will be thrust down to hell. So you see, Jesus is saying that people who we ordinarily think are going to be greatly judged, like the people of Sodom, people who were sodomites, they were homosexuals, they had all kinds of sexual sin, they were full of bread, the scripture said, and idleness, they didn't strengthen the hand of the needy, and there are many things that uh, Sodom was guilty of. But nevertheless, if they would have heard the gospel that you and I have access to, they would have repented long ago. Okay, so uh, this is the great thing. This is where judgment uh, is warranted because we know the gospel and they didn't have a Bible. We have a Bible. And the Bible said that, that it will be more tolerable for those people on the day of judgment than for those who have not, uh, 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 those of us who have not heard those people who have not heard the gospel will be more tolerable for them for those than for those of us who have ready access to the Bible. Now, I made another statement here. The apostles in the book of Acts did not emphasize the love of God. A cursory reading of this will show this is true. Now, God's love is demonstrated because he sent uh, the people out to preach. Behold the feet of them that bring good news and good tidings. And this is an expression of God's love, the fact that he poured his Holy Spirit out, that he granted repentance. These are all expressions of God's love. But you don't have people being told by the preacher that God loves them. You will search the entire book of Acts. When they turned the world upside down, they spread the gospel all over Europe. You do not find that recorded there. Now, everything else is recorded in there. Surely, if that was emphasized, it would be there, but it's not, okay? So the book of Acts did not emphasize the love of God when preaching to unrepentant sinners. Sinners, They emphasized God's righteousness, sin, and judgment to come. That's what Paul did. He said the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Okay, because he is appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness. When he went before the Roman leadership, he reasoned with them concerning, concerning sin, righteousness, temperance, judgment to come, these types of things, okay? The worst thing you can tell a rebellious sinner is that God loves you. That's the worst possible thing you can tell them. You say, Brother Robert, you are crazy. We've been doing it for 50 years. I know we have. And we've been wrong for 50, probably 100 years in the way we have been emphasizing things. And that's why the world's in the shape it's in. That's why this nation is going down the tubes. It's because people are not hearing the gospel the way it should be preached. The same is true in the West and Europe. They haven't been taught and preached the gospel the way it should be. I was listening to the great late G.W. North the other day, and he uh, was in 1979 had preached a message on repentance. And it's one of the most powerful messages I've ever heard. But he told the people, you've got to repent. You have got to repent. But apparently, even when the people he was preaching to had never heard that. And understand, these are prophetic circles that people are moving in. But uh, we've got to turn from our sin. and We have got to turn to God. We have got to bow the knee before the Lord. Okay? And I have a little saying here. You can read it. Disagree? Challenge me in the comments. If you can find a place in the book of Acts where somebody's told Jesus loves you, Go ahead and put it in the comments and we'll discuss it. But you're going to be looking for a long time because it's not emphasized. The judgment of God is emphasized. That's what this world needs to be thinking about. You are doing evil and God's wrath is over you. And you need to turn from your wicked ways before you are completely destroyed. You think about America and the world. We're under a pandemic right now. We can't even go to church the way we should. Isn't that getting people's attention? Well, you keep on telling people Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, and they're not going to get it. People need to be thinking in terms of the fact that God's judgment is upon this world, and if they don't turn, it's going to be the same situation as happened with Noah in the days of Noah. And I have this section here that I entitled Reformation Tragedy. Reformation Tragedy. The Reformation placed an emphasis on salvation by grace through faith, and rightfully so. Because certainly we can't make it to heaven by works, right? We can't do that. But here's what happened. 
the Reformation gave rise to a sort of hostility towards works, okay? As if works don't matter, as if works don't make a difference. Well, you need to tell that to Jesus because he sure emphasized it a lot if works don't matter, okay? Now, I'm not saying that we're saved by works. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But it goes on to say, we are his workmanship, created unto Christ Jesus, unto good works, in Christ Jesus, unto good works, for which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we understand that we're not saved by works, but our works are what are going to be judged in the judgment, okay? So it is vitally important. So I think what we've done, to a large degree, is we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We're so worried about works-based salvation that we don't emphasize works at all. And it's by your words, it's by your works, it's by your deeds, okay, that you're going to be justified. And it's going to be by these things that you're going to be condemned. So it's important that we understand it. The reformers past and present have too often neglected to emphasize the fact that the hum every human being, past, present, and future, are going to be judged according to to their works. That's what the scripture tells us. And it's important that we understand that. You say, Brother Robert, are you against the Reformation? No, I'm all for it. I've taught uh, these types of teaching. I'm, I'm salvation by grace through faith. I'm the whole thing. But at the same time, I recognize that there's coming a day in which God is going to judge the world. He's going to judge individuals and he's going to judge us based upon our works. And it's important that we know that. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his fa Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. See, this is a future event. This is a prophecy that's being made, okay? This has nothing to do with what dispensation you're in. This has nothing to do with, okay, well, that was under the law, and this is, no, 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 no. He is saying right here, there is coming a time when he's coming with his angels, and he's going to reward everyone according to their works. See, understand that. Now, Son of Man is a messianic title uh, that emphasized Christ in the last Adam who had earned the right to judge all men, of course, as we mentioned before, having been tested in all points like as we, yet without sin. Mark 13, verse 32 to 37, But of that day and hour knows no one, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray. Watch this. For you do not know when the time is. For the Son of Man is like a man taking a far journey. He left his house. He gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and to command the porter to watch. Watch you therefore, for you know not what hour the master of the house does come. At midnight, when the cock crowing or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you sleeping. I say unto you, watch. That's what the scripture teaches. And you have these types of warnings all throughout the Bible. Listen, any theology that takes the edge off of these types of warnings have to, has to be regarded as contrary to the teachings of Christ. Jesus is speaking clearly and he's telling you, when the time comes that I am about to return, there are going to be people that get lax in their relationship with God and they start doing one thing or another and they're not being watchful. And there are several verses that speak along this line. As a matter of fact, the Bible talked about the wise and the foolish virgins. Half had their oil, half did not have their oil. And then the bridegroom came when the others didn't have their oil. They were not ready. Okay, so these are things that needs to be emphasized in the world today. Okay, a lot of these theologies that we have been arguing about and talking about all of these years. We've been on Sermon Index arguing. We've been on every single website we can get on and argue these theologies. Listen, the scriptures are so straightforward that even at 10 or 11 years old, I could understand them as a child. And they got my attention and they made me think about the fact that there's coming a day when I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account for my life. And we need to have an urgency about this because we are living in a crisis hour. This isn't time to, to gentle Jesus meek and mild. This is time to tell people you need to turn and repent. You need to have an attitude like Noah 
an attitude like people who preach like Elijah or John the Baptist, who has warned you to flee the wrath that is to come. Because this, this world is in a mess, and it's going down the tubes really quick. Just in uh, right in the middle of this pandemic, you got these people so brazen up in Oregon. What did they do? Suddenly they passed laws to let people not just smoke marijuana like I had to deal with a week ago in Colorado, but you got people can start taking the hard stuff now. If you want to, you can go ahead and shoot up heroin. This is the madness of society, see? And we need to preach repentance. We need to be thundering the word of repentance. And we need to be thundering that judgment is coming if people do not turn. Matthew 8, verses 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come in the east and the west, they shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever thought of how horrible that is? Weeping and gnashing your teeth, people gnashing their teeth from, from pain. You'll remember that the story that was given of Lazarus and the rich man and Abraham, that he said to Abraham, send Lazarus because I'm tormented in this flame. Touch the, his, his finger to water and touch it to my tongue because I'm burning in this flame. See, if there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is serious stuff, okay? But you've got the mockers, and I can already see my Facebook feed being lit up right now with all the liberals and the people who, you know, we've got people who call themselves Republican in name only, rhino, well, sino, Christian in name only. Listen, we need to be warning people about what's going on today and what's happening in the world. Stop you know, patty caking around. It is time to get serious. This passage is akin to John the Baptist's warning to the Jews who came to him to be baptized. And what did he, they say? They called him a generation of vipers. Asked them, who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? Told them, do not say to yourself, you have Abraham to your father, because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. What does that mean? Don't rely on the fact that you believe you're one of the elect. Because that is what the Jews believed. They believed by birthright they're one of the elect and they can never be lost. As long as they don't do anything horrifically bad, they will never be lost. Listen, John the Baptist said, God is able these stones to raise up children to Abraham. He said, the axe is now laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's what the scripture said. You look over in the book of Hebrews, the earth that drinks in the rain that comes often upon it, brings forth fruits, meat for him by whom it is dressed, it receives blessing from the Lord. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected, it is near unto cursing whose end is to be burned. And the writer of the Hebrews said, but brethren, we, we hope for better things than that of you and those things that accompany salvation. But you have warning after warning in the scripture. You would have to literally have blinders on not to see this all through the New Testament. Again, the fact is always in play that the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree does not bring forth good fruit, hewn down, cast into the fire, regardless of the confession of faith or the physical birthright. You say, well, Brother Robert, I said the sinner's prayer when I was 10 years old, and I'm saved forever. Well, I think you need to read the New Testament, okay? You really need to read the Bible. You need to study it for yourself because it's your soul that's on the line. There's nothing more precious to you than your soul. And if you don't care about your soul, then you're not going to study about it. But if you truly do, you'll make a life study of the things that I'm talking about here. The issue is fruit, okay? If your life is bearing fruit, okay, then if you're in the vine, you're bearing fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, the Father will take you away and cast you aside as a branch that's, that's going to die, okay? Again, thorns and briars are going to be rejected and burned according to Hebrews 6 verse 8. Matthew 12, 35 to 37, the good man of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Evil man of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when he uh, was caught up into the heavens and he was in the presence of God? And his response was to say, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. 
and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He became conscious of the fact that he had spoken words, that his mouth had spoken things that were evil or wicked and vile. And not just that, but the people around him had done the same thing, okay? And what did Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The things that we eat that go into our mouth and into our body, they do not defile us. It's what comes out of the man's mouth. That is what defiles him, okay? So it is out of the wellspring of the heart that our mouth speaks. And there's so much I'd like to say about that tonight. But understand that by our words, we're going to be justified. By our words, we're going to be condemned. When we start speaking, it's like everybody can get a printout of what's really in our heart. Take a recorder around with you. Listen to the things you say on a daily basis. Do you want to know where you really are spiritually? Get all the words that you are recorded. I was listening to an old tape one day, uh, just recently last week, because I had some old Hi8 tapes so I was converting to digital. And there was a long section of tape. This is going back 15, 20 years ago, okay? And a long section of tape where my tape recorder was recording and I couldn't, I didn't know it was on, apparently. It was just black. It was like it had fallen against the wall, but the record button was on. It was recording everything that I was saying in that room. And I sit there and listen to what I was saying. And I was just shaking my head thinking, wow, you know, I don't remember saying any of that. What was I even talking about? What was going on that day? Different things like that. But it was a, it was a warning to me, okay, to watch the things that you're saying. Don't just say things. Don't throw things out there. You know, things that could hurt people, things that could be harmful, judgmental type things, things that don't line up with the Word of God, okay? Words that are not profitable. The Bible said every idle word we're going to give an account on the day of judgment. Now, if you want to just pray a blanket prayer over it, say, Lord, cover all my words in the blood, well, you can try it, but we'll see how it works out in the judgment because I'm not going to risk it. I think that we need to be careful with what we say. Okay, words that bring harm to the work of God or to people or are blasphemous are going to require an answer to God. I didn't say it's going to send you to hell, but I think God's going to ask us, what were you thinking? Why did you say that? Do you realize the harm that caused? You should have listened to me. I think it could be something like that. I don't know. It, it just means we're going to give a word. We're going to give an answer. We can plead the blood all we want to, but we're still going to give an account to God for our words and our works. Nobody has outsmarted God or found a way to circumvent the judgment. We can't just up and push the reset button every time we want. Oh, oh, you know, push the reset. Oh, whoa, I'm not going to have to. No, listen, we are going to be judged. We're going to stand before God and give an account for our life. Again, we may be saved, but we're going to give an account. Say, Brother Robert, what does that look like? I don't know what it looks like, and neither does anyone else. But we've been told it over and over again. So we need to think about it. We're all going to give an account. We not, may not be cast into hell, but we're still going to give an account. And what that looks like, again, it remains to be seen. And that's why I said at the very beginning, I'm not here to give you a definitive statement about the judgment of God and, you know, uh, you know who's going to be Jezebel's wife in the rapture, as the old time preacher said. That's not what this is about tonight. I just want to get your attention. I want you to look into the scriptures yourself, okay, and see what the Bible says about judgment. And just, just get you a Bible and just mark everywhere that relates to judgment in your Bible as you're reading, all through the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all the way through, and then just flip through the pages like this and look at all the yellow when you're done. You'll be surprised. I want to just move on to 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, and we're coming to a close tonight. And I want to talk specifically about how this judgment is going to kind of look in terms of believers. For other foundation can no one lay except what is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, that's one category, or wood, hay, or stubble, Every man or every woman's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try everyone's work of what sort it is. Notice that. What kind of work is it? Will it withstand the fire? Will it withstand the test? Will it withstand the fire of God's judgment when he applies fire? If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, 
that is within the kingdom of God, within the work, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see that. So what is Paul saying? He said he was the wise master builder. The Greek word is architecton. He said, I've laid the foundation and other people build their one. But everyone take heed how you build upon it. I'll tell you what I believe this is talking about specifically here. It's dealing with the fact that when we preach the gospel, we need to preach in such a way that the result is gold. It is silver. It is precious stones. It is not hay, wood, or stubble. The result being people who have genuinely repented, have turned to God, brought forth works worthy of repentance, They've received the Holy Spirit, and then they are encouraged as a disciple of Jesus Christ to walk in the Spirit, to remain faithful unto death, to receive a crown of life. There are people that go around, and, and I'm not knocking, I'm just saying they may have hundreds of thousands of people that they minister to on television, or maybe they have millions, and they may have tens of thousands in the stadium, and they preach a gospel to them, and they get a quick response and then there's nothing to it. They don't change, nothing happens. Let me tell you, that's putting hay, wood, and stubble into the foundation of the body of Christ, into the, into the building. But it's a very different thing when you will preach in such a way that the person will do as they did in the book of Acts chapter two and three when Peter was preaching, and they asked the question, what must I do to be saved? You see that, what must I do to be saved? He preached in such a way that they were cut to the heart and they wanted to know, what do I need to do to be saved? See, this is not what happens today. People get talked and talked and talked and it's like they're being pulled along and pulled on. Come on, come on, come on, repeat this prayer for me. Come on, hurry up, just repeat this prayer. Listen, that's a wooden stubble, friend. That isn't the real thing. And that's why they don't show up the following Sunday. That's why they don't show up the following week. It's because you're trying to build the foundations of God on things that won't withstand the test. But what do you do? You preach to them. And then when they say, what, what must I do? You lead them and you give them the appropriate instruction. You'll remember when it said of Peter and of many like things did he counsel them saying, save yourselves from this untoward or from this wicked, twisted generation. See, the Bible doesn't give you everything that the preacher said, or that Peter said, or that Paul said. We just know that everywhere Paul went that he preached that people should repent, turn to God, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, it's what he told Agrippa in Acts 26, I believe it is. So we know what they preached, and we know that they stayed with it until the person truly came through to God. They truly received the Holy Spirit, okay? And then when they had truly received the Holy Spirit, they were the real deal. They were bona fide. They were authentic, okay? None of this pleather stuff. They were the real thing. And when the fire is applied to them, they are gold. They are silver. They are precious stones. When you preach a sermon, is it a sermon that's precious stones? When you do a teaching, is it precious stones? When you do good works, is it precious stones? Why are you doing those good works? Are you doing to be seen of men? There's much that could be said along that line, and we'll close with that. When the fire's applied, all the hay, wooden stubbles you can see in my illustration is going to be gone. The only thing left are these precious things. And these are not the easiest things. Have you ever seen people pan for gold? Have you ever seen how hard it is to get gold out of the dirt and it takes tons and tons and tons of dirt to be processed to get just an ounce of gold? Silver. I've been to a silver mine on two different occasions. Listen. It's not easy to do that. Those men would have to crawl in those mines in the old days and mine that silver out, and then it would have to be processed. That is a lot of work. But we want the quick thing today, don't we? Just say a quick prayer with them and then say it's all good. No, all you're doing is creating hay, wood, and stubble. If you want precious stones, gold, and silver, you're going to have to stay with them. You might have to do like the old-time preachers do and pay them a visit the next day. Go knock on the door and say, how are you? You were sitting last evening at the anxious bench, and I just wanted to know if you came through to God last night when you prayed. And can I pray with you? 
See, that's the way it used to be. Staying with people till they got a relationship with God, keeping them in the fire until they began to burn. Okay, this is the way it works. But all of this real quick fix kind of stuff that we've gotten today since the industrial revolution has come and entered our minds in terms of evangelism, the, evangel the industrial revolution destroyed evangelism because people began to think that you could stamp out people like you stamp out products and it just doesn't work like that. But then finally, prepaid rewards. You say, Brother Robert, what are you talking about? Man, you've really been radical tonight, but this is really radical. No, listen to what the Lord said. Matthew 6, verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, do not sound a trumpet before you. In other words, don't, hey, look what I did. Make a post on Facebook, as the hypocrites do. Or, you know, I just need to tell you this information of what I had to do. No, you didn't have to tell that. You could let not your right hand know what your left hand was doing. Listen, do not sound a trumpet before you when you give to the needy, as the hypocrites do. Look how he called these people. When you do that, you're being a hypocrite in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised of others. See, when you do things for the praise of men, listen, Jesus said, they have received their reward. So you think, okay, well, I'm going to get a reward in heaven. No, you've already got your reward. If that's what this verse means, it seems pretty straightforward. You've already received your reward. You say, well, I'm laying up treasured in heaven. Then why did you announce it? Why did you put it in the newspaper? Why did you announce it in front of the church? Why did you tell all your friends? Listen, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And your father that sees in secret will reward you openly. There'll come a day, the Bible said some men's sins go before them to judgment, but other men's good works and some men's sins follow after. Some men's good works go before them to judgment and other men's good works follow after. What does that mean? You know, a lot of times we like to emphasize all the good we've done and kind of hide the bad we've done. That's what it's about. But we ought to do the other thing. We ought to confess when we've done evil. And we ought to be very silent and secretive about the good we've done. And then we get to the judgment. God reveals it. He's going to say, here's what the real truth was. You guys knew all the bad things. You thought he's a really bad guy because he was always confessing his sin. You had to never let him see his sweat attitude, but... He told all of his situation, but look at all the good works that he never even mentioned. They followed after him. People are going to marvel at how wrong they were about people because they simply followed the teaching of Jesus. Thus, when you give to the needy, do not sound a hypocrite again. They have their reward. When you fast, Matthew 6:16, 6, do not look gloomy. Again, look what he said, like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces. You know, why would you go on Facebook? Oh, I've been fasting for days. I've been fasting for weeks. Hair all messed up, looking all disheveled. Listen, that's not the way it works. What did he say to do? When you fast, wash your face. Anoint yourself. Go outside like nobody even needs to know what's going on. Nobody needs to know what's happening but, but you and God. And the Lord that sees in secret will reward you openly. But pe people who are doing things to be seen, listen, truly I say to you again, they have received their reward. They've already received it. The praise that they were seeking was the reward that they received and the reward that they're hoping to get in heaven, it's already been paid out. See, that's the key thing. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about the judgment. People think, oh, I'm storing up all these things in heaven. When I get to heaven, I'm going to have all these things. Well, only if you followed the teaching of our Lord. Don't go spreading it around. Let it be between you and God. Let your reward in heaven be the fullness of the reward. Let your reward be gold, silver, precious stones. Do things according to the way God say to do it, said to do it. And if it doesn't yield anything, it doesn't matter. The fact that you were faithful will be gold, silver, precious stones, okay? But if not, it may look like you've done a lot. You may get up and say, you know what? We had 500 people saved. But when this fire gets put to it, it's going to be hay, wood, and stubble. And there's going to be a lot of disappointed people. But you can change today. You can do it God's way. You can go the route, the difficult route, the minor route, where you find precious stones down in the ground. you got to hunt for them. There's a diamond 
there's a diamond field in in Arkansas where you can go and look for diamonds. Listen, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But when you find it, okay, then you've got something. But people don't want to do these types of things because it takes a lot of effort. I just want to pray tonight before we go. I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful tonight to come together for Delaware Christian Fellowship and talk about this great topic of the judgment, Lord. Lord, it is my prayer that if nothing else tonight, maybe it's provoked some to wrath, maybe it's provoked some to fear, maybe it's provoked some just, it, maybe it's encouraged others, Lord. It is my hope and it is my prayer that they would make a study of what your word teaches about the, the last days, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the judgment of God, the great ju right throne judgment as some would call the judgment seat of Christ or what they would call the Bema seat judgment. Lord, it is my prayer that each and every person watching this would take it upon themselves to read these scriptures so that we can have an ever-consciousness, uh, ever-conscious mindset of what these things are. Lord, the preaching and the teaching, the false preachers, the false prophets that are all over television that are trying to say peace, peace when there is no peace, healing the wound of the daughter of your people only slightly. Lord, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want a right balance. We don't want to be over the deep end in judgment. We don't want to be over the deep end in grace. Lord, we want to be in balance. And Lord, just help it be before our eyes, not so that we live in fear, but that we are conscious of the fact that we are someday, when we stop breathing, it is appointed unto man, wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Lord, I pray that the blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse us from all sin and that, Lord, that you would cast our sin as far as the east of the west and, west and remember them no more. But, Lord, I am truly conscious of the fact that we will give an account of, to you for our lives because your scripture warns us and tells us over and over. Lord, I just pray that you would be with the people, be with the churches tomorrow, Lord. Be with each and every one that is sick, Lord that we have already mentioned them earlier in the service in prayer. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you for being with us tonight. And next week, at Lord willing, we will look at the final judgment and uh, what is awaiting, unfortunately, those who have refused to turn to Jesus Christ uh, as their Lord and Savior. And that will be the final session in Basic Bible Fundamentals. God bless you and thank you for being with us tonight.